Hey guys, welcome to Platitube U.S. History. Um, this is video three in the five-part series of the causes of the Civil War. And this one's going to be about Manifest Destiny. Now, oftentimes Manifest Destiny is cited as the leading cause of the Civil War. But here's the thing, Manifest Destiny forced the issue of slavery to the forefront again and again. And every time the argument came up, meaning every time the U.S. expanded into new territory, the debate became more and more heated, more and more violent. So I'm going to talk about uh, like around eight things related to Manifest Destiny um, from the most peaceful, and you have to put that into quotes, um, to the most contentious. Um, first up, we have the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and it served as a significant pivot in the controversy over slavery. The Missouri Territory um, applies for statehood, and in response, the Talmadge amount, Amendment was added to um, halt importation of slaves into the Missouri Territory and to gradually liberate those that were already in bondage in the territory. Um, this struck many as an overstep of governmental power, um, so, and, like, the debate gets really heated, and, and Henry Clay has to step in, you know, the great compromiser. He steps in to manage the negotiations, and he authors the compromise of, uh, the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Now, that settles the debate, sort of, for now, right? Um, and the terms are this, Missouri was admitted into the Union with no stipulations around slavery. Maine was also admitted as a free state. And it created the boundary line, the 3630 line that really says north of the line is uh, free and south of the line is slave, slave states. So this is supposed to settle any future negotiations regarding um, expansionary debates and or expansion of slavery debates. So here's the deal. Here's why it's important. People in the north... Um, well, people both in the North and the South really uh, brought baggage. They brought baggage to this debate from previous debates that had existed from before the time of the Constitution. And the immediate context is necessary to really understand how the Missouri Compromise um, fits into the bigger picture of the Civil War. So here's the thing. Missouri, it lay way too far north for for comfort, right? It, for... Missouri really to enter the Union quietly as a slave state um, because that far north slavery seemed less necessary and much more threatening um, as opposed to the deep south. Plus the north was concerned about western loyalty to the Union so losing the fight to restrict slavery in Missouri and southerners threats of nullification and murmurs of secession during the debate led to Northerners um, vowing resistance to any new territories that allowed slavery. At the same time, this compromise, the debate that led up to this compromise, allowed Southern arguments to not only shift away from um, slavery being seen as a necessary evil to slavery being seen as a positive good, but it also helped enunciate the finer points of this new argument, which is a little scary for the Northerners, right? And it appalls them, this idea that slavery is good. Um, but the compromise does work, at least for about 20 years, a little over 20 years, right? Then we have the annexation of Texas. And um, in the presidential election of 1844, John C. Calhoun, who is the leader of the Southern Fire Eaters, remember, said that annexation was, quote-unquote, essential to the peace, safety, and prosperity of the South. Um, it can be argued that while the Missouri Compromise helped bandage the wound of slavery, the annexation of Texas really rips that band-aid off um, and exposes that wound. So Texas, the Texas annexation is going to unleash demons uh, that had been really repressed since the Compromise. Um, the, deba the debate became so heated over Texas um, in Congress that it took nine years and finally, a bypassing of the traditional um, method of passing legislation um, by creating a joint committee to pass a resolution. Now, this annexation will cause a multitude of events. It will cause anger over disparate outcomes of the Oregon and Texas territories. Um, it will lead to almost directly the Mexican-American War that can really be argued as like the watershed event of the, 
the march towards the Civil War, um, the Wilmot Proviso, which comes out during the Mexican-American War, and really the division of the Democratic Party um, is going to start here with the annexation of Texas that's going to lead a lot of disillusioned um, Democrats to the Free Soil Party, and that division is really going to allow the Republicans to take the election in 1860, so keep that in mind. Um, because here's the problem, Northern Democrats saw Texas as a victory for slave power. Not Western expansion, but the expansion of um, slavery. And they really, it strengthened fears of that increasing slave dominance within politics, within um, the morality of our country, however you want to look at it. They just saw it as a problem. <clears throat> now out of that list that I just talked about, the effects of Texas annexation. Let's talk specifically about the Wilmot Proviso and talk about um, how it was seen and its um, significance. So many in Congress saw the, the Mexican-American War as a land grab from Mexico, which everyone was totally cool with as long as it did not lead to the expansion of slavery for some. Like for the South, they wanted the expansion of slavery, but for the North, they, they absolutely did not. So, um, this proviso proposed a um, ban, basically, complete ban on any slavery or any form of bondage in any territory acquired from the Mexican-American War. Now, it never passed into law because nobody could ever agree on it because the South, while they, while they did not have dominance in Congress, they did have some power. Um, but even though it didn't pass, by 1850, 14 out of 15 northern states are going to um, basically require their congressmen to impose the proviso, whether it passes or not, in any territory gained. Um, while at the same time, an increasing number of southern states are promising secession, should anyone try and impose that, that proviso. So really, by the end of it, people are kind of like, hey, man, we got to chill out. Um, so at the end of the war, the idea of popular sovereignty really starts to make a rise in uh, political circles and spheres as a way to create a compromise of sorts. Now what pop popular sovereignty is, it's the idea that people in any territory, um, any new territory could vote and decide whether or not their, their territory, their state was going to be slave or free. Um, this doctrine was made official when it was incorporated into the Compromise of 1850, um, because in 1850, the Union was on the brink, at the brink of war. So, um, and the Compromise is really going to forestall war for another 10 years. And Henry Clay, he's like 73 at this point, he's really freaking old, but he's going to step in one last time. Um, it's honestly not his best work. And it is influenced by the ideals of the younger guard, um, specifically Stephen Douglas, who is a senator from Illinois. Um, and they're going to come up with the terms and people are going to agree on them. Um, and nobody's going to be really happy with the compromise. Everyone's going to feel like the other side got more than they did. Um, but that's how compromises work, right? So here are the terms. One, it's going to admit California as a free state. Two... Um, Texas is going to be required to release their, their claim over the extension of territory following it all the way up the Rio Grande, um, setting the western border, the northwestern border of Texas that currently stands. And in exchange, the federal government is going to assume the $10 million debt that Texas still holds over from being a republic. It's also going to um, allow for the idea of popular sovereignty in the remaining territory of the Mexican session. And that's really the New Mexico and Utah uh, territories, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is like really great because then the idea is that these people will vote for no extension of slavery, right? Um, that's not exactly what happened, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and the last piece that is probably um, the hardest for the Northerners to accept is going to be a um, expansion of the Fugitive Slave Act and um, making it harsher and stricter and more stringent 
and it's going to give the U.S. Marshal Service uh, jurisdiction or authority to actually pursue and persecute <coughs> to enforce that new act, which they didn't have. It was a power they didn't have before. Um, it's also going to eliminate the detour uh, through D.C. that any buying or selling or trading of slaves, what they used to have to do, they used to have to come through D.C. and basically get a custom stamp, right? But they don't have to do that anymore, um, which is great for the Southerners. They're very excited about this. Um, they're not really excited about California coming in as a free state, um, and they would like a little more assurance that New Mexico or Utah is going to come in as slave other than popular sovereignty, but the fact that the Fugitive Slave Law is harsher, they're like, woohoo! Um, unfortunately for them, the Northerners just decide that, uh, yeah, they'll agree to it, but they won't actually enforce it, which they don't. So the Northerner, the Southerners are not the only ones that are going to practice the idea of nullification. The Northerners will also practice nullification when it comes to Fugitive Slave Laws. Now, um, this compromise was necessary um, because the federal courts had deemed that the 3630 line, you know, it was originally assumed that it would just continue on through, right? But the federal courts deemed that the 3630 line from the Missouri Compromise only applied to the Louisiana Purchase, the territory in the Louisiana Purchase. So this did not extend into the territory gained from the Mexican Cession. Um, and this, the crazy part is this won't be the only time the courts are going to get involved in the debate over the extension of slavery. So in 1857, Chief Justice Taney and the Supreme Court will rule against Dred Scott, um, a slave who had maintained he had been emancipated through um, just the sheer living in um, Illinois, which was a free state, and also federal territory above the 3630 line, which had forbidden the um, expansion of slavery. So he was in free territory, so he said, I'm an emancipated slave. Um, unfortunately for him, Dred Scott's master, he was, he was in agreement with this, but he died before he had written anything down. He was in agreement according to Dred Scott. And his master's wife said, nah, nah, you are still mine. You're my property. You, you are not free. But the Supreme Court is going to rule against Dred Scott. And they're not only going to rule against him, they're going to take it one step further and they're going to um, basically invalidate the Missouri Compromise. They're going to say that was unconstitutional. Congress doesn't have that power. 3630 line is invalid. Um, so it struck a severe blow to the legitimacy of the emerging Republican Party. It struck a severe blow to the abolitionist movement. And it also intensified, severely intensified the conflict over slavery. So um, that's problematic because there's all these things that are really starting to build up, right? So um, finally, there is the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, this act was considered a compromise, a, a last ditch or a quick fix, right? Built on the idea of popular sovereignty or that doctrine. Um, in determining the admittance of Kansas and Nebraska as free or slave states. Um, they were te territories, and what this act does is it, instead of like a peaceful voting or decision time, what happens is both pro and anti-slavery forces are going to descend upon these territories, and they're basically, it's going to be like a microcosm of the Civil War, this tiny little area where, where um, these two forces are battling it out. It's going to be the, the primary battleground before the Civil War even starts, which is why it, you know, appropriately receives the moniker of Bleeding Kansas. So, um, it, it was this area, yeah. So that is Manifest Destiny, some major points in Manifest Destiny. Um, so Bleeding Kansas was 1854, Dred Scott was 1857, Civil War starts in really, like, 1861, but um, secession begins in 1860. So um, keep this in mind. We are leading into the Civil War at this point, and forces are starting to really get crazy. Okay. <laughs>